Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this big fella right here, Warhammer Quest Blackstone Fortress, put out by Games Workshop, and it is basically a campaign style game. So let's get down to the table. I'll show you how it works on a very basic level, and we'll come back with some final thoughts in just a few moments after that. The gist of this game is that the explorers are trying to find four clues uh, so that they can assault one of the strongholds that are uh, protecting a hidden vault. Uh, once the explorers find four clues, and those clues are found in the discovery deck, then they will be able to announce on their next expedition that they're going to mount an assault on a stronghold. Once they have defeated four strongholds, again, finding four clues for each of those different strongholds, then they will be able to mount an expedition to go into the hidden vault. And once they've done that, they will be able to uh, claim victory and so forth and so on. Now, what basically happens here is that there's going to be three different steps in the round, exploration round, which is going to be, first of all, an exploration step where we're going to flip a card and do whatever it says. If it's a challenge card, then we simply are going to be rolling some dice possibly uh, and maybe taking some wounds, maybe not. If it's a combat, we actually set up combat board and go through the combat and so forth and so on. After the exploration step is over, where we draw one of these cards and do all that kind of stuff, we go to a recovery step where it's possible that we may be able to heal some wounds that uh, we have gotten on our people throughout the the course of fighting and combating in the fortress. Uh, you're also able to trade cards during the recovery step and uh, the leader will be passed to the next player uh, during that recovery step. So the first thing that happens in the uh, exploration phase is the exploration step where the top card or the leader uh, draws the top card of the exploration and simply, for example here, a challenge, you simply do what it says. So for example, this one says, deal out one discovery card for each explorer and place them face up in a row. Uh, then roll an activation dice for each explorer and add that explorer's move value to the roll. Any explorers with tied scores have collided with each other and fallen down. Make a defense roll for each explorer that falls down. If the defense roll is failed, that explorer suffers one wound. Out of the explorers that did not fall down, the one with the highest score receives the face-up discovery card of their choice. Then the explorer with the second highest score takes one of the remaining cards and so on until all the explorers that did not fall down have a card. Any cards that have not been taken are then shuffled back into the, to the discovery deck. So in order to do this race, we have to flip over one, two, three, and four discovery cards, just like this. Then we're going to roll an activation die for each person. So for example, Pius Vorn here has a move of three. So his roll is going to be a five, six, seven, eight. Uh, Jaina Strake over here has a move of two and they have a six, seven, eight as well. So these two have collided, they're actually out. Now these two over here, Rain and Rouse have a move of two and they have three. And then Amelin Shadow Guide has a move of three and has two. So, so at this point, what happens here is that Amelin Shadow Guide is going to be able to uh, choose a card of her choice. She's absolutely going to choose to take the clue because those are the th we need to find four of those in order to assault the first stronghold. And then uh, Rain and Rouse here are going to take two credits for uh, use later on. Now, these two that collided and fell down have to make a defense roll. So, uh, Pius Vorn's defense roll is one of these guys, and he's looking for a success, at least one triangle, and he has a critical success, so he's good. He doesn't take any damage. Um, uh, Janus Drake's defense over here is a, an eight-sided die, and he's looking for at least one. Okay, he didn't, so he's actually going to take a wound just a regular wound, not a grievous wound, which really hurts. And basically what that's going to do is that's going to lessen the amount of dice he's going to be able to use to activate during any combat rounds later on in the future. Now these two will just simply be shuffled back into the discovery deck. Now that the expiration step is over, we go to the recovery step. During the recovery step is where we check to see if any of the 
uh, characters are out of action. And that in that case, we have to make a mortality check or something to that effect where we roll this and we consult the table to see if they die or if they're able to continue on. Then we can also make vitality rolls. Now, vitality checks are where you can actually try to heal um, uh, wounds on your person. You can do this right now during the recovery step, or you can also do it during a combat if you take a re recuperation action, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so basically, since uh, Janus Drake here has taken a wound uh, as a, a, from bumping into Pius Vorn here during that race, he has to make a vitality roll. So he's going to take this as determined by his player sheet here, and he's looking to uh, try to get some successes. So he doesn't get a success, so nothing happens. He's going to keep this wound. If he had gotten a uh, one success, just a normal success, he would have been able to remove one wound from his player sheet. If he would have gotten a critical success, he would have been able to remove up to two wounds from his sheet. But since he rolled that blank side, nothing happens, and he's just going to have to live with his wounds for right now. That's the end of the recovery step. Then, uh, during the leader step, this will be passed over uh, to the next player in clockwise fashion. And then we go to another exploration step where Almond and Shadow Guide is now the leader, and she will draw another exploration card. So we flip it over, and it's a combat card. So now we have to set up this area and begin a combat round. Now that a combat round has begun, what we have to first of all do is find out who exactly the group is encountering. So we will turn over a number of encounter cards uh, determined by how many of these little triangles came out. So uh, in the first area down here, we have some spindle drones. And since it's number one, then two spindle drones come into that area. So we go ahead and put this down here. Now, what that also is going to denote is a place that can be searched to find more things, possible clues about where that stronghold might be uh, located. So the same thing is done for the other two locations as well. Number two here, uh, four Urgles come out uh, right over here. So that's uh, pretty easy. And then the third one is going to be three Negavolt cultists over here. And that's what these little guys are. So we'll go ahead and put these guys in here like so. Next, what we have to do is build the initiative deck. So what we're going to do is we're going to take number one, number two, number four is not gonna go in there because it's not on the board. Uh, and then number three, and then all of the other heroes have their own initiative cards as well. This is put together, shuffled and then put out in initiative order. At this point, each of the heroes are going to go ahead and um, roll their activation dice and put them on the board like so. We also have to make a destiny roll where we're going to roll these black dice that can also be used for activations amongst the different uh, people. But we're going to roll any duplicates that are rolled like these two fours right here are taken out and are un unusable, but these that are not duplicates can stay up here and these three can be used by any of the uh, group members as they uh, wish. Now, before the initiative phase ends, there is a last part of it called gambits where uh, heroes can try to get the leg up on the hostile groups that are in here. So for example, if they really, really needed to or wanted to, uh, Rain and Rouse and Amulet Shadow Guide and Janus Drake could try to switch places with some of these different hostile groups to go before they are uh, triggered in the initiative order. And in order to do that, you'd have to use one of your dice uh, from your activations and then you'll roll your agility die. If you get a success, then you can swap one space if you get a critical success, you can swap with anywhere in the order. So as we go into the activation phase, what happens here is hostile group one goes first. That's the spindle drones. So we turn this over and we go ahead and roll the dice and see what happens. All right, 16 comes up and uh, they are not hidden. They can see uh, the explorers. They're not engaged, which means they're not uh, adjacent to each other. They aren't in cover and it isn't close range because they aren't within two hexes of each other. So any other activation happens here. We roll the 16, so it's advanced. What does that mean? You simply move toward the closest explorer, then attack the closest explorer 
if it's in range. So we flip this back over. Uh, what is their movement? Well, they move two. So they're going to simply move one, two up like this. And then they're going to attack. Well, the range is four plus. Uh, and the threat level is zero, so they're just simply going to uh, take a couple shots at Amelin's Shadow Guide here. So uh, two of these dice are rolled. There's one success, so Amelin has to make a defense roll, uh, which is this kind of die as well. So we roll that, and it's nothing, so she takes a wound, which is going to take away one of her activations. Now, as it comes to Janus Drake, Janus Drake has that wound from the challenge that we faced before we got into combat, so he only has three activation dice available to him. These activation dice are used in such a way that each of these different abilities has a die value attributed to them. So, for example, I can use my pistol and uh, rapier if I use a one uh, a die that has a one or higher on it. But if I do flurry of attacks, I need to have a four plus or a six plus in order to use one of those guys. So what I'm going to do here, first of all, this is really annoying. I want to try to take care of this wound. So my first action is going to be a recuperate. Recuperate takes a one or higher. So we're going to go ahead and use the two in order to make a vitality roll, which means that we're going to roll one of these eight-sided dice trying to look for successes. And I did get a critical success, which means that I'm going to be able to remove this wound and another one if I had it. And so now I'll be able to roll all four of my activation dice at the beginning of the next combat round. But he's not finished. He's going to go ahead and make another attack. Uh, well, he's going to do a couple of things. He's first of all going to use this four uh, to move two spaces. So he's going to go one, two, like this. So we're going to use his pistol and rate player, which is only a one plus, And we used a four to do that. And it's a two to three range because there are one, two, three range away. There's no cover or anything like that. Cover is denoted by these white lines that are here. Uh, so we're going to roll an eight-sided die and we're looking for uh, one, uh, one or two successes. And that was a miss. So it just grazed their head or what have you and no damage done. But that's the end of his activation. Okay, so now the next one is the Urgles. And so we have four different characters here. So we've got to make four rolls on here to see what they do. So the first one, first guy is rolling a 16. He's going to rush. All right, so he's going to uh, move three. That's what rush means. And then he's also going to make a charge action, which is the rest of what rush means, which is right down here. So you make a move and then you make a charge. And a charge is moving three and then attacking a leader that's next or, or an explorer that is next to the person. Okay, so that's what that guy's doing. The next guy is going to three. Uh, he's going to actually fall back. Okay, so a fallback simply means that uh, the person is going to double their movement and move to a place where the explorer cannot see them. Well, he can already not see them, so that's simply, let's just say he moves over that way to carry out the extent of the movement. Now, he's also, the next person rolls a 20, oh boy, which is also a rush, so he's gonna come up here and attack as well. And then the final dude back there, also a rush. And that guy comes up here like so. So Janus Drake here, uh, the genius that he is, stuck his neck out and he's about to get it hurled at. So we've got three attacks. I'm going to roll two of them right now. All right, so that's one wound that's possibly coming at him. And then one more, and that's nothing. Okay, so what... Janus gets to do now is he gets a defense roll against this guy. So we look at his profile. It's an eight-sided die, so he's going to roll. And if he gets a regular success or a critical success, he can he can ignore that wound. But he doesn't. It came right back. Man, he just got through mending that. I guess the bandage popped off during the battle. After all of the other explorers and hostile groups have activated, then we go to the event phase where we're going to roll on the event table that's right here. So we roll a 20-sided die and okay it's 20. Lucky find the leader picks an explorer that explorer draws a discovery card so the leader is going to pick uh, Janus Drake he's the one that's wounded so he's going to go ahead and take okay so he has some Archaeotect uh, to possibly purchase some resources at the end of the game. All right, so that's the event phase. So what we would do now is go back to the destiny phase where these destiny dice are rolled 
And any duplicates, oh wow, that hurt. So there's only a one and a four that we can use this turn. And then activation dice are rolled for each of the different characters. And then an initiative step is redone where the initiative deck is taken up and reshuffled and put out there so that we can see. Another gambit phase could happen, and then we go back into the activation phase. Now, you'll see that uh, the explorers were pretty did a pretty good job of clearing out a lot of the Urgles and the Spindle Drones, which are kind of squishy anyway, and then they got pretty lucky on the uh, uh, Negavolt Cultists as well. So, when those activations come up, you'll actually make an activation roll uh, to see how that works. So, if you roll uh, anything four or higher, no new uh, models are spawned, but you would basically consult this table right here and it would tell you. So if you roll a one, two, or three, some more uh, of those bad guys will come out, but four or more, uh, nothing else is respawned. Uh, but you just continue going through that. So basically what you're trying to do here, that's how the combat would continue. But what you're trying to do, you of course want to go and search these different areas to possibly get more clues from the discoveries. But at any point in time, if you're next to a portal, you can summon the, the mag live to come to where you are and you can go on so that you can end this exploration phase, go back, possibly heal up a little bit uh, before you head back in. So uh, you don't have to knock out everybody, but you do want to try to uh, uh, search as many of these places as possible so you can get, uh, hopefully, as many clues as possible. But that's pretty much how the combat round works. But once you determine that you're done with this expedition and you want to go back to the precipice, that's when you can go back and use your archetype weapons. You can go to any of these ships and choose to get different resources. Additionally, one thing that I didn't show is that each of these ships has a support ability during the game that you could possibly use. So that's one thing that I wanted to put out there as well. But uh, you would basically flip it over to the facilities and you can uh, interact with the different facilities during the, during the uh, precipice phase. And uh, that's where you're going to be using these things to buy resources, so forth and so on. You'll pack things up in all of these little uh, handy dandy uh, saving cases so that you can, or bags rather, so that you can pick up where you left off uh, and no worries there. But that's about it for how the game plays. So that's that for Warhammer Quest Blackstone Fortress. Now I have to say the Games Workshop is continuing to impress me on and off, uh, there have been some hit and misses, of course, but uh, they are continuing to impress with the board games that they're coming out with now. This is a board game. It's not a, a miniatures game or anything like that. It's not a tabletop miniatures game. It's not, uh, I mean, they still have line of sight rulers and that type of stuff, and you're still rolling dice for your units and that kind of thing. So they haven't strayed too far away from their bread and butter, but this is a board game uh, through and through, and uh, it's, it's a good one. Have that. I know it's a little bit of foreshadowing, but uh, <laughs> let's get to my pros and cons, shall we? So my first pro of the game is a component quality. And yes, I'm talking about all of the components, not just the miniatures. Now, the miniatures are top notch, as you can expect from Games Workshop. If uh, I know that there's people out there that will probably disagree with me and, you know, basically, and I, I mean this in the nicest possible way, they would be wrong, uh, but Games Workshop really does have, I think, the best miniatures in the industry right now. Um, there, And I don't say that for any other reason other than the fact that I think it's true. Um, the uh, level of detail on these miniatures is astounding in very many cases. Some of their new stuff for Age of Sigmar that they're coming out with is amazing and how it looks and how it looks even before it's painted, not to mention after it's painted, but you get the idea, right? Uh, you can just pretty much take that to the bank. When you're talking about Games Workshop, the miniatures are amazing. As long as you're talking about their regular flow. They do have some stuff that is uh, a little bit more on the basic level, and some of that can be a little iffy, but this stuff is great. So, with that having been said, the other components in this game are also good. Um, the uh, boards that are used, the tiles that are used, the fact that it's a modular board. Um, the dice are uh, custom dice and they're nice etched. They're not, you know, heat printed or anything like that. The cards are probably the one 
slight falter here because they're uh, lower quality, uh, but that's the only place. And I think that, uh, you know, with some, maybe some card sleeves, they'll be just fine. You're not using a lot of the cards every game anyway, so it's not like a whole lot of wear and tear is going to happen. So I'll give them a little bit of a pass on that one. But when I am talking about component quality, I'm talking about on the grand scale of things, and it is good. Now, my second pro of the game is the explorative nature of the game. And now I actually put this on my top 10 exploration games uh, list just a few weeks ago. So you already kind of knew that I liked it for this reason, but it is definitely one of the pros. Uh, that exploration deck, you never know what's going to come up. Is it going to be another challenge or is it going to be another combat? Uh, yeah, yes, it is. OK, is it going to be another combat? Yes, it is. How about now? Is it a challenge or a combat? It's a challenge. You never know what's going to happen here. And the challenges are usually really simple to go through, but the combat is where the game really kind of takes off and flies. Um, I like that. I like the fact that you're looking for clues, which is in a discovery deck, that you have to go out and, and uh, look at these different points of value on the board. I like the explorative nature of the game. It really does kind of fit that niche for me, and uh, that's a huge pro for me, too. A third pro for me is the uh, the dice activation system that it employs and the wound system that it employs as well, where uh, if you take wounds, you're going to be rolling fewer activation dice. I like that. I think it's thematic. I, I think it's a, a great way to handle how wounded your character is. He's not going to be able to do as much uh, if he has more wounds on him, which is something that a lot of other games kind of gloss over, which is fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But I like that this game addresses that um, construct, so to speak, where uh, if, you're, if you're taking more wounds, you're not going to be able to do as much. Another thing that that dice activation system really kind of does is uh, also limits you're not always going to be able to do your most powerful attack. And having those dice and the different number of pips that are rolled on them, you're not always going to be able to do your most powerful attack. Sometimes you have to use the, you know, do a little bit of grunt work and not, not the heroic stuff. So I like the, the dice activation system really handles all of that very well. And I think it's a great thing. So my fourth pro for the game is the initiative system. Now, the initiative system is really cool because I also like the gambit part of the initiative phase where you can kind of possibly switch the order in which you're acting around these different hostile groups. And if you're uh, standing right next to a hostile group that's going to go before you, you can try to make that gambit roll and switch places with them so that you get to go first. I really like that because it takes initiative and uh, doesn't really turn it on its head, but it definitely provides a twist there that's uh, thematic uh, and a little bit more realistic. If you see that they're starting to uh, gear up for a pretty nasty attack, you can try to preempt that. I really enjoy that system a lot. And with all that having been said, there are some cons. So I'm going to go ahead and hit on some of the things that I didn't necessarily like about the game. Uh, first of all, how the hostile groups interact with you. I do not like having to roll that Blackstone Fortress die for every single model in the group. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have house ruled that where you just roll once and that's how the entire group acts. Yeah, you could get yourself in a little bit more of a tighter pickle um, because if they all charge, then you're rolling that many more dice. But it's a lot easier and it's a little bit more streamlined. So I don't like how the rules make you roll for every single model in a group to see what they're going to do. I think that they would act as a group more often than not anyway. So I've house ruled that. Didn't like that in the rules at all. And my second con for the game is that there are a couple of clutch points uh, where the game just kind of seizes up a little bit. Uh, and that is when the combat comes out, um, it kind of stops and you've got to set up the board and you have to do all of this other stuff. And there's a lot of bookkeeping. And then, OK, let's get back into the game and rolling dice and moving stuff around and, and that type of stuff. There's a clutch point there. And then there's also another clutch point. But there's, it's a little bit more of a natural clutch point where you go back to the precipice phase and uh, you can buy stuff and all that other kind of thing. And uh, that was a little bit convoluted for my tastes. I wish it would have been a little bit more easy um, then make this roll and do this and then make that roll and do that. And, uh, I just would have liked it to have been a little bit more 
streamlined, I guess you could say. Uh, and the part where you're putting out the board, you can actually have multiple setup times <laughs> during one session, which is not necessarily a bad thing. There is, you know, there, there's diversity there and, and that's good, but it is a clutch point. So I had to mention it here as a con, but really that's about it for uh, Blackstone Fortress. I really did enjoy my experience with the game. And I think this is one of the Games Workshop board games that got it right for the most part. So I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. I do like it. Um, I do like it a lot. I think it has a lot of staying power and it's got a little bit of longevity to it because you're not just going to be able to knock out a win uh, just like that. You're going to probably have to play this game over multiple sessions, uh, maybe even with the same group of people. That would be a cool thing to do as well. But uh, I did enjoy it. I think this was a great move for Games Workshop as far as providing a board game experience that you can play with their miniatures. And of course, the other cool thing about it is if you are one of those tabletop miniature people, you can use these miniatures in your army. They actually do have data sheets uh, for that as well. Where is it? It's right here. So they have data sheets for all of their uh, things that they have in there as well. So you can use them in your other armies, 40K and what have you. So seven out of 10 for Blackstone Fortress. Thanks for joining me and I certainly appreciate it. We'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. Take care.